Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob towards the promised land. Today, it is me, Brian Broom, who has usurped power and has uh, gained the authority to host this podcast. I am joined by our former, now fallen from grace host, uh, <laughs> Emily Maxson. And I've been banished to third chair. <laughs> banished to third chair. Get thee hence uh, to a nunnery. And... Uh, Greg Unninger as well. And today we are going to be talking about King David, uh, where last week we discussed Saul and the rebellious attitude that he had towards the authority of God and of uh, the prophets and the priests and really the entire system. Uh, We now get to see a wonderful contrast with uh, David, who is not yet king, but he has been anointed. And Greg, why don't we Take it from there. This is one of those stories that when it either tells in detail and takes a really long time because it covers lots <laughs> of chapter chapters, or one says, there is no time. I will sum up. <laughs> <sighs> we'll go with that one. Uh, we left Saul rejected by God with the warning that God had sought out a neighbor of his, a man after his own heart, who would inherit kingdom. That was chapter 15. In chapter 16, God sends Samuel to anoint a young boy named David. He is the eighth child of a rather large family. He is of the tribe of Judah. And God, having rejected his brothers, older brothers, one by one, because God looks at the heart, finally says, this is the guy. And Samuel takes a horn of oil and anoints David the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord comes upon David from that day forward. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and the evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Now, the thing is, David, of course, is not made king by the anointing. God has simply pointed out, this is the man who will be king. But it's not that simple. He has to be received by the elders of Israel. That would mean telling them. And, well, see, but there's this guy who's already king. Uh, yeah, it's kind of awkward. So nobody <laughs> says anything at this point, but the, the, Saul's advisors note that things are not going well with him. He is apparently demon-oppressed, if not demon-possessed. An evil spirit continues to trouble him, and he's, he has bad moods. The servants say, well, how about someone plays music for you? And someone pipes up. I've seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who's cunning and playing and a mighty valiant man and a man of heart. Now, he seems to be exaggerating here because at this point, David wasn't even old enough to serve in the army. But there were these this thing about killing a bear and a lion. So uh, based on that, and he was a a skillful harp player. They summon David and David stands before Saul and and Saul loves him. Because he's just this this innocent little boy, godly young man, hard worker, plays beautifully. And uh, he keeps him there for a while. And every time that David plays in his harp, the evil spirit goes away for a while. Then comes the story we all know, so I won't spend much time with it. The Philistine armies gather together. Meanwhile, David has gone back to his sheep. And uh, Philistines are on one side of the valley, Israel on the other. And out comes this champion, this giant who we all know. His name's Goliath. Yes, he was a real giant, averaging, what was it, somebody's around nine and a half feet, I think. Yeah. And he, he defies Israel, defies God, uh, and, and asks basically for a champion from Israel. He wants to do a duel. Whoever wins, wins for the army. The one who, if anyone was going to take him up on this, it obviously should have been Saul. One, he's king. Two, the whole reason for having a king was so he would fight our battles for us. <laughs> mm. Three, he's head and shoulders taller than everybody else in Israel. So <laughs> although he would still be quite a bit shorter than Goliath, he would be the closest approximation they had. But he's not going out there. David returns to check on his brothers and his father's instructions. Hears all this, sees all this, and makes a commotion of, why isn't anyone doing anything? What happens to the guy who, who deals with us uncircumcised Philistine? Word gets to Saul. And eventually David gets permission to go out and fight. Now, this is ridiculous. David's probably 16 or 17, maybe 18, maybe 19 if you stretch it. He's not in the army or he'd be there. 
and military age was 20. It's Saul's the one who should fight this. David has no standing whatsoever. And yet Saul sends him out. It's hard to understand what he was thinking. And, and, and here come, here, side note, here might come a lot of moralistic applications of, yes, little child, you can go out and fall, fight giants too. No. First of all, <laughs> David is not a small five-year-old. And the reason he's going is he knows he's anointed to the office of king. And if the king isn't going to do it, well, he figures that makes him next in line and God has prepared him. You mean well, he wasn't junior asparagus sized? No, no, not quite. No. Are you telling me <laughs> that VeggieTales isn't completely accurate? It, it, it was excised from the canon of the Council of Nicaea. Oh, <laughs> that explains a lot. <laughs> <sighs> About the time that Santa Claus was punching out areas. Anyway, <laughs> something else never happened. And Die Hard was declared a Christmas movie. And Die Hard was declared a Christmas movie, yes. Except that one actually happened. Yeah, well, well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> David throws the stone with his sling. Smites the head, crushes the head of the, the serpent-like intruder with a rock, brings him down, takes his own sword, the Philistine's own sword, cuts it off, and thus turns the tide of battle. So that's great. Uh, just because it's cool, I also want to point out one, one an Hebrew fact that I know mm -hmm. is that <laughs> Goliath's armor is described with the word kaskazim. Mm -hmm. which means scales, scales like a yeah. serpent. Ah, that's where the it's, snake resemblance comes in. It is a scale see. armor, yes. Oh, and can I can I throw out... <laughs> see, I'm, I'm third chair now, so it's not my responsibility to keep us on track. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but last week, we had this whole conversation about uh, the mark of the beast and loyalty mm. yeah. and foreheads. Mm. Yeah. And where does David's stone strike Goliath? <laughs> Ooh, right yes. in the forehead. Right. Sinks in like water. Just stone in water. Well, they, Saul is thrilled. And all Israel is thrilled. They, they chase off the Philistines. Saul says, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping you. Jonathan, Saul's son, who hasn't been on camera yet, probably would, knowing his faith and courage, he probably simply wasn't there. But he shows up at the last minute or comes in and hears about it. And he does something amazing. He takes David aside and it says, the text says he loved him as he loved his own soul. People have made horrible uh, deductions from that. Uh, this is an honorable, pure love of an older brother for a younger brother. Jonathan was probably about 50 by now. And he, he sees this young man who obviously God has great things for. In fact, he knows what those great things are because here... When the king would not do his job, David did, and did it. Ob and this this was miraculous. And David was great with the sling and all, but this this was the work of God unquestionably. So Jonathan gets it, and without a grumble, without a complaint, without a bit of envy, jealousy, he takes off his robe and his weapons and hands them over to to David, saying, "In effect, you're the next king," and he's okay with that. It takes Saul a little bit longer to figure out what's going on. In fact, it really doesn't happen until uh, David leads a war band out. And as he returns in triumph, the women of the city go out and sing, Saul had slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. Exaggerations both. But <laughs> the point was that, well, Saul puts it this way. They have ascribed unto David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. And what can he have more but the kingdom? Well, <laughs> okay, you've been told twice you're out. <laughs> you 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 deliberately failed to do the king the king thing, the king's job. You you yeah. were expecting what exactly? And it it seems like quite a jump. Like what? There are no shades of gray between being loved by the people and being actual king like yeah. well <laughs> you know maybe a lesser prince a... general you know something in between those someone two. will take over when you retire right do we have to do we have to push for escalation here but well, he there's also a a type there where it's the even the people recognize all of israel for 
generations has been looking for the seed of the woman to come, yes. the the mm-hmm. the great king, etc. I mean, we even see that in Israel's um, blessing to Judah before his death. Mm-hmm. There also there's a recognition here that whoever's coming is going to be a greater, and in type in many other instances, but this is just a small one that I, I've noticed here. There's the tens of thousands that David has slayed compared to Saul's thousands. We can think of every type of Christ that we see in scripture mm-hmm. has slain their dozens, whereas Christ has slain all. Yes. And speaking of such things, David, it would soon be known, is of the tribe of Judah. Ah. Mm. So, you know, it's, again, it, it would have been possible for Saul to sit back and and let David be. And he probably, David would have fought faithfully for him until God arranged otherwise. But no, Saul, we should be reminded here, I think, of Herod the Great. God, God's put someone new on the scene. I can fix this. I can kill him. <laughs> no, you can't. You can try and do a lot of damage along the way and kill other people, yeah. but you keep missing. And, it's and, almost and, like they think they're going to live forever. Almost. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's what it's all about, isn't it? Mm-hmm. How and on what terms? David picks up his job as a court musician as well. And Saul sees him there and decides, I'm going to deal with this. I'll smite him to the wall. And he throws his javelin at him on two occasions. And he misses. David makes his dexterity roll and is able to flee in God's providence. And and then and, and then here's where we're going to speed up our, our, our summary. Things happen. <laughs> Saul tries to put David in more danger. It, it doesn't work. He tries marrying him off to one daughter, but that doesn't work. He marries him off to the other on the condition of a very dangerous dowry. David comes back with more than that. And Saul is just really frightened here. He goes on to tell his son Jonathan to to kill David. And Jonathan talks him down out of that. And, And then yet again, one more time. This is in chapter 19. The evil spirit from the Lord was upon Saul as he sat in his house with his javelin in his hand. David played with his hand. And Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with a javelin, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence. This time, Saul just doesn't let it go. He, again, pushes for escalation. He sends uh, messengers to the house to collect David and bring him back for execution. But David's wife, Michael, Saul's daughter, helps him escape. And David runs and flees to Samuel. And but God, and when Saul goes to Samuel, God intervenes now with some miraculous, uh, <laughs> you're going to be in a trance and make a fool of yourself. Thank you very much. David goes back to Jonathan. Jonathan sorts it all out or tries to. And, and but then realizes when Saul throws a spear at him as well, that this is where we've, we've crossed the line. There's no coming back this time. He warns David to flee. And David flees to the city of Nob, where the tabernacle is. And that's a whole story in itself. And then from thence, he tries running away to Gath to the Philistines. They don't like him because those 10,000s he slew were Philistines. So David has to act insane for a time until he can escape. Then he flees into the wilderness and a band begins to collect about him. His father's house first, and then everyone that was in distress, everyone that was in debt, everyone that was disconsented gathered themselves unto him. He became captain over them, or at least 400 at the start. So he's he's got a little warrior band. But, you know, these are not the, the, the cream of the crop here. Everyone who's discontented, <laughs> try building a church on that principle. Well, I've met people <laughs> who have, actually. Um, Saul ends up killing all the priests. David tries hiding in one city after that he's actually rescued, uh, hoping for their support, but they won't give it. He has to run again. And and so it goes. There's there's this on again, off again. So whenever Saul has an opportunity and, and has some idea of where David is, he chases after David, and David runs. There are two particular stories in all of this that I think we should look at. One, David and his men 
they're in the wilderness and Saul's pursuing with 3,000 men. David and his men have hidden in a cave. Saul doesn't know where they are, but he needs to use the facilities. So he sees a cave. He says, there's a great place to use as a bathroom. It's very private. I'll go in there. And drops his gown and, and, and yeah, does that. David and his men are in the sides of the cave and his men are saying, hey, behold, look, they're very spiritual. Behold, the Lord, behold. <laughs> um, this is the day that the Lord said. No, the Lord said no such thing, but they're trying to get him to kill Saul within all this. And David's um, response is, well, he kind of ignores him, but kind of, he doesn't kill Saul. But he sneaks out and takes off part of the King James says his skirt. The word there is the word for a wing because God's people are in their garments are pictured as birds or angels flying in the midst of heaven with their their parts of their robe as wings. And this is where the blue fringe was attached that every Hebrew was supposed to wear. Mm. At the very least, the, the, the robe was a symbol of Saul's office. And if it is the part bearing the blue fringe, when David cuts it off, he's saying two things at once. He's saying, you're not fit to be king and you're not even one of God's people. Ooh. And his his heart immediately smites him. And he says to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth my hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. And David won't let his men do anything either. Saul goes his way, and David comes out and shows him what's happened. Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how the Lord had delivered thee into the state of my hand. Some bade me kill thee, but mine I spared thee. I said, I will not put forth my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. And he shows him the skirt of the robe. The Lord judge between me and thee. The Lord avenge me of thee, but my hand shall not be upon thee. The Lord therefore be the judge and plead my cause and deliver me. So at that point, Saul, oh, is this the voice? This is thy voice, my son, David. And Saul weeps. <clears throat> he gets very emotional, very like Esau. <laughs> and, and, and turns away for a time. But it's not over yet. When word gets out, again, this time at a different city, the David's out and about. Again, Saul comes with a host. Very similar, but this is chapter 26. This point... Uh, Saul's camped out among the hills, and God uh, throws him and his men into a deep sleep. David, with his uh, cousin, or his nephew, Ahimelech, not Ahimelech, Abishai, the son of Zariah, go down into the camp, and they take the spear and the pillow and the water bottle, and they come back out. And then at a distance, and apparently, this is one of the questions that people often ask, how is it that people can shout at other people? And be heard so clearly. Apparently, the air in Palestine is just of that quality that it carries voices a <laughs> long way. Because they're, they're at a safe distance when they do this. They call out first to the captain of the guard and then to, to Saul. And uh, Saul says, is this thy voice, my son, David? Yeah, it's my voice. Oh, okay. And again, the whole thing again. I, I had the chance to kill you, and and, and I didn't. And, and the men who, if, if men are lying to you, cursed be they before the Lord. They've driven me out this day from abiding in the inheritance of the Lord, saying, go serve the gods, because God is worshipped in Israel. To be, to be uh, exiled from Israel is to be chased into the territories where other gods are given their freedom, where demons run things. Saul says, I've sinned. And ask David to return. And Saul gives him back his, his spear and such. But he doesn't trust Saul. Saul goes his way. And, and then things go downhill. David is just having, having this small victory. He decides very logically, I'm going to die someday. Saul's going to win. It's all over. I might as well go to the Philistines. What? But that's a story, <laughs> for, that's a story for another time. So David... Never at any point, this, this is where we're going with all this. David is the anointed of God, anointed by an official prophet, not self-anointed, <laughs> not, not in a private vision that no one's seen. 
he has shown himself publicly to be worthy of the king. In fact, he's done the king's job in killing Goliath. He has become the military commander of Israel under Saul. Jonathan, the, the heir apparent, has transferred his uh, inheritance to David. Mm. And yet when Saul turns on David, apparently nobody beyond Jonathan does anything about it, expresses any horror, tries to stop Saul in any fashion. There are elders in Israel who can, in theory, could have called him to account, but they never do. The priests have no authority because the one time that they do something that Saul doesn't approve of, he kills them all. Uh, and so David's out there on the run. Think of someone hiding in the American West from federal marshals. It would, he would not be too far off. A lot of places to run, none of them pleasant, none of them enjoyable, all of them fraught with difficulties. And David has an army, and he will use it against the Philistines and against other enemy tribes, but he will never use it against Saul. And speaking of the American West, here's a good point of comparison contrast, and I think uh, a fit starting point for the rest of what we need to talk about. In the typical American Western, the good guy who generally holds no office, if he did, he doesn't have now, probably an ex-Confederate or maybe Union soldier. He's out there on his own. He's really good with the gun. And when the bad guys come, he shoots them. When the bad good guys come, that is, you know, people who do have authority but are bad, he kills them. And that solves everything, and he rides off <laughs> into the sunset. It's the Texas defense. They needed yeah. killing. Yeah, exactly, because they were all bad. And that is very much ingrained into the American psyche, vigilante justice. Mm. I mean, let's face it, the whole Marvel franchise is built on the idea of it. Of vigilante justice. Yeah. Except for Captain America. Captain America <laughs> has actually been duly instituted by the United States government to right. do things. He, he yeah. was. And yet when the Sokovia Accords came along, well, in he, fairness, he the didn't UN. want to like. That was the UN. He rightly. Different. No one, no one should ever put themselves under the UN's authority. My gosh, this is true. This is true. But you know, the, the Captain America is the only one also to to use a gun, to my recollection, which I mean, gives me no Tony's end of satisfaction. Stuff. Of like, finally, somebody is willing to pick up a weapon and take care of the problem. But maybe that's me being an American vigilante. <laughs> maybe I don't know. <laughs> well, you know, to step into the the neighbor the neighboring universe, the DC universe, when Batman was created, he did use a gun, but that didn't go over well, especially since comics were for kids, huh. and so they very quickly had him uh, abjure any kind of lethal force from there on out. He would never use a gun, and therefore he never took care of the problem. Yeah, and that's why because... he has a roster the size of his leg. <laughs> So, vigilante justice, there are tyrants, there are dictators, there are people who have usurped authority, there are people who are commanding us to do things that not only are irrational, senseless, and dangerous, in some cases they're commanding us to do things that are at odds with scripture. So, in those extreme cases, then we can get a gun and shoot them, right? No. No. <laughs> Not that, yeah. that's not the first step <laughs> <laughs> or, or or necessarily even the is last it, one yeah is it any of the steps <laughs> it's not, sure not on it the is. list i don't know i feel like there's a dot 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 at the end of this page and maybe it's on the next but one. i turn it yeah. over it's on the other side it's in the middle of the other side it's bolded <laughs> quotated italicized <laughs> but you know yeah. I, I work with teenagers and 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 Right now, many of the, the young people we do work with are from the ex-Soviet Union, mm. where they call tyranny, tyranny. Mm -hmm. And there, I, I do have to keep reminding these teenagers, the solution is not assassination. It is not anarchy. It is not raising up a militia and going and shooting people. Mm. I mean, that's, that's what we base. This is a situation where you could argue these people nominated and elected David to be their leader, and they are an army, they are a militia. Can't they go and take down the bat? Because look, look, we got to get Saul. He has been rejected by God, rejected by God's prophet. Uh, the clear successor stands in line, whom he is now trying to kill. He's trying to kill the Lord's anointed. Mm. And then he murders 
all the priests, except one. A lot of people would say, you know, I mean, what would we think if, say, some random governor of some random state or province decided to kill all the pastors in his territory? Might not we be tempted to say, this is time for an assassination? Well, we'd and at yet, least arm the pastors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, David, yep. David didn't do that. He ran. Now, th th and this is, this is a point. Mm -hmm. He did commit civil disobedience. The king clearly wanted him to come back for execution. David said no and ran away. He <laughs> did disobey the king. He didn't submit? He did not submit at this point. Jesus said to his apostles, if they persecute you in one city, flee to another. There, There is a point where fleeing from persecution and tyranny and lawlessness is a valid option for Christians, even mm -hmm. if the people doing the persecuting are people who have legitimate authority. Mm -hmm. It is lawful to get out of the state, crossing borders that are guarded, crossing them secretly at night with, you know, dress like a raccoon or whatever, <laughs> and, and defying all kinds of uh, state laws to preserve your life from those who are lawless. And David is out there in the wilderness with God's complete permission. In fact, God sends a prophet to hang out with him prophet named Gad, and he eventually sends the one priest who did escape, along with the Urim and Thummim, the means of getting yes-no answers from God that belonged to the priest. So God is honoring him in many ways, but David is, is not allowed to do anything violent to the king, nor, although, although he's tempted on the one occasion, he doesn't, and when he's slightly tempted on the second, he, he doesn't, he just makes a big deal over this turning into show up, look, I'm the good guy here. You're the bad guy. Leave me <laughs> alone, please. Mm. So th there are things here that he does that are not the humble, submissive, I am here, please kill me, kind of attitude that sometimes we we, we see pacifist exhibiting. Uh, but he does not raise armed resistance against his Lord, his king, for he mm -hmm. is the Lord's anointed. And so I guess that's where we go now. The basis for all this is not the fact that Saul was elected by the people. First of all, he wasn't, <laughs> although they all approved. Mm -hmm. But he, his authority comes from God. And here we insert Romans 13, the powers that be ordained of God. Mm -hmm. They don't derive their just powers from the consent of the governed. No, they don't. That's not a Christian doctrine. Now, if by that you mean that the authority passes through human hands in that we recognize God's calling, the elders had to confirm Saul's, so later they would have to confirm David, then that's, that's okay. And some of that hangs about the Declaration of Independence and, and that time in our history. But the underlying uh, theology of most of the churches was covenantal. Uh, they called elders and pastors, the congregations did, but not, it wasn't a popularity contest. It wasn't a uh, who holds the best opinions. It was who has God called. We will now recognize that. Uh, and so in civil government, the same. There's, we have this position. Uh, we've, we've crafted a constitution that specifies its nature. Now, who would God have there? We need to recognize who this is. But if you mean, yeah, the people have this inborn authority somehow. Because, you know, we have that by nature and natural law or something. And we can, if we want, somehow give up this inalienable right in an, in an inalienable way. I don't understand <laughs> what that is all about. Then we can give them the authority. And then we can take it back because it's all about us. Mm. That's John Locke and that's Tom Jefferson. And that's one way you certainly can read the Declaration of Independence. But that's not biblical. The authority is God's. God dispenses it, but he does, and in different ways, in different fashions, sometimes allow people to set out how this will be. Sometimes it's as simple as your son and your son after you to a thousand generations. <laughs> sometimes it's, all right, everybody, who are we voting for? Raise a hand. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the power is God's. The authority is God's. And therefore, the powers that be are ordained of God. There's nothing outside of God's providence. Nobody gets mm -hmm. into 
into office accidentally. They may have committed evil to get there, but that too is within God's providence. God often gives us exactly, no, he often gives us exactly the rulers that either we deserve or that he needs to be there for some other purpose. Yeah. Uh, and so we have nothing to complain about along those lines. And yep. God says very simply that we as private citizens are to obey and to submit. The exception being here, David's a private citizen. He is allowed to run. He's allowed to hide. And we can show other places in Scripture where others who share his sentiment who, and want, want to be on his side can hide him, even to the point of, and here a lot of good Presbyterians, Reformed people disagree with me, lie about it. Yeah, they went that they went that way. Um, yeah, there's no one in that um, that well over there that you can't even see because they covered it up. Um, you know, things like that. There so are no Jews in the walls. Rahab. Yeah. Sorry, what was that, Brian? Oh, there are no Jews hiding in this house. Yeah, there are no Jews yeah. hiding in this house. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's interesting too that the Romans 13 that you have quoted a couple times now is there in the context of a discussion of vengeance and yeah, you David, know, it is. <laughs> you know, while Saul has attacked David, he has not managed to bring him to any harm. Mm. So there's not a vengeance to be taken even justly. Yeah. Well, he, the best he'd have is like a self-defense if in the moment, in the moment right. he was yeah. being attacked. Yeah. yeah. And, and the Bible does allow for that, but that becomes, then we become very, we have to be very, very careful. What if the bad guy is a crooked cop who has a gun and you've done nothing wrong and you do have a gun? What do you do? Then? Those are hard, those are hard calls. And anyone who doesn't think that's a hard call doesn't get it. Anyone, yeah. Oh, that's obvious. I'd blow him away. Well, you may have a problem there with your attitude because that's something that we should really struggle with. Mm -hmm. Yep. The, Sometimes we have to trust God in such matters. And, and it's, it's, very, it's so ingrained into the American consciousness. That no, 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 he's a bad guy. And, and I kind of um, referenced uh, one of Arnold Schwarzenegger's lines. I think it's in True Lies, where his wife discovers he's a spy. You killed all these people, yes, but they were all bad. You know, the, the, <laughs> that's the justification they they were bad, and therefore uh, I, I was all right to kill them. Well, you're not a magistrate. You're not a king. You're not a judge. This is not a legal process. You're, Romans you're 13, even like when it talks about their authority, it, it mentions like they they don't bear the sword in vain. The ceremonial yeah. sword that you see on Caesar's hip. Yeah. It's not just for looks. There yes. is an actual <laughs> weight of punishment behind their authority. And that authority is derived from God's dispensing it to them. You don't get yeah. to just say, well, I get to decide who dies because they did something bad to me. Yeah. And yeah, there's an implication here for the the so-called problem of evil, which I like to reframe as the problem of good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it yes. is, uh, there's a line in, in, in a song by HB where it's talking about you know, looking out in the world and seeing how could God let all of this happen? All mm. of this, this horrible things. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then the, the song goes, well, should the Lord remove all evil? I'd be first in the line. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the context. I, I'd actually like to read Romans 13 in context, because the context is this. It starts in chapter 12. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. And then skipping a couple verses, recompense to no man evil for evil, provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves. Now, the allusion is to the avenger of blood in the Old Covenant, who did have the right to execute people responsible for act, even accidental deaths. But rather give vengeance, but rather give place unto wrath, for it's written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, thou she shall heap coals of fire on his head. And be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. Let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. 
Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Wilt thou not? Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is a minister. In the word of Greek is he's a deacon of God, to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth, the sword, beareth not the sword in vain. For he's the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon all them that do evil. Wherefore you must needs be subject not only for wrath but also for conscience. Mm -hmm. Now. The implication, of course, is that rulers ought to recognize where their power comes from and ought to use it the way God says, and that God himself will hold them accountable one day. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way, the psalmist says to the judges and kings of the earth. Mm. Uh, yep. Now, having said that, does that mean that you can't do anything with a bad ruler but grin and bear it? Well, our country was founded upon an idea, somewhat secularized idea, but it was rooted in part, in, in Presbyterian and Puritan covenantal ideas, which which says this, God, I mean, Calvin hints at it in the, the last chapters of uh, his institutes, but doesn't develop it. He says, look, there are other magistrates that God has put in power. Yeah, They all have the responsibility to enforce God's law. By the way, Calvin insisted that they needed to enforce both tables. And so, although the private citizen should never rise up as an anarchist or an assassin or revolutionary, those who have been put in positions of power, who themselves also legitimately bear the sword, should pull in the reins on the wicked rulers who aren't doing their job. And, and we have, and the American system was built on this, the balance between the federal government and the state governments. If the if a federal official does something wacky, run to the local cops. If local cops do something wacky, call a federal marshal. If the state courts won't give you justice, then can there be a fee on the, ba on, on the basis of the Bill of Rights to, or the, the Constitution generally, to uh, a federal court, to civil rights? Mm. Can you appeal your case from the local corrupt judge up to a higher court who may give you uh, a solution, even up to the Supreme Court? Supreme Court's not doing this job. There is this thing called impeachment. We've never done it to a Supreme Court judge, although we've done it to a few presidents. You know, there, there are a lot of options actually built into our system that allow us to peaceably remove people. One of the chief ones is term limits. Everybody has to come up for re-election, even in the original system. Mm -hmm. President was four years, Senator six, representatives two. The only ones who are stuck there for life were Supreme Court justices. And again, they're they for good remote. behavior. Yeah, they're there for good behavior. They yeah. could be yanked. Mm -hmm. And as uh, some one or two presidents have tried to do, you can also stack the court with guys who are on your side and see if that works. <laughs> so there, there are options, checks and balances built into the Constitution. But more broadly, as Christians, we do have the right to turn to other magistrates, <laughs> other rulers at other levels, and call for them to lawfully deal with an existing problem. Yep. But if that's a far call from getting a bunch of your buddies together with your rifles and going out and shooting at people. There's, there's no similarity there at all, because in the one case, you're submitting to God's due order. In the other, you're pretending to be God yourself. And the Bible is very clear about which we ought to do. It's just that it's, sometimes it's hard because <laughs> we have tempers, we're selfish, we're stubborn, we want yeah. things our way. And it's so nice when the other side gives us the option of saying, but they are all bad. I can kill them, right? No, you can't. And, and that's, as we reach the end of an age in America, as things are going under tremendous shifts in, in what we accept and what we don't, and what's possible and what's not. I think the church really needs to get a hold of this and needs to mm -hmm. preach this. Yeah. Uh, there, there may be a time for reworking our government, but um, going out and killing them, running up a bunch of the bad guys and killing them and then taking over is not it. Mm. And God will not bless it. And it will generate a whole lot more trouble than it will solutions. But we're impatient. We, we don't want to have every, we don't want a majority. We don't want a vast majority that we have won through evangelism to Christ. We want, you know, me and my buddies and our guns. Yeah. And, that's not it. I'm also thinking of uh, some more, I guess, broad is the right word, principles where mm -hmm. 
we know that love is the fulfillment of the law or that yes. the doing of the law is the fulfillment of love in a kind of feedback kind of loop <laughs> right. situation. And so generally speaking, if you ever find yourself in a position where you are hatefully dehumanizing someone else mm. because you don't like them, you're yes. not really fulfilling the law. And one of the ways that I, I see it uh, is in the way that we speak about our leaders, uh, mm -hmm. whether they are on our side or not. Uh, if they don't do something we like, it is often very quick towards name calling, uh, right. insults, uh, you know, mocking appearance, things like that, mm -hmm. mocking names. Like um, this, this is a very, very mild one, but you know, Governor Nuisance is is what I've heard him <laughs> called sometimes. And I, I get it. It's funny. It, I, it I is laugh funny. At it. I can't I deny laugh that it's it. funny. <laughs> I laugh at it, but it's also not There's a danger there. The honor yeah. due to uh, a minister of God, even if he doesn't realize that he's a minister of God, and even if he right. is wrong in how he's wielding his power mm -hmm. and the authority that has been granted to him. We we have, as Christians, a higher duty and higher calling to find the middle way between adoration and demonization. We need to mm -hmm. respect them for the the image of God that they bear in their mm -hmm. very being yeah. while saying, but the things they're doing are wicked or evil if they are in fact wicked or evil. We also owe to every man the fulfillment of the ninth commandment, which is to deal honestly right. with them and speak honestly about them and not slander them. Uh, the Westminster Catechism or Confession, I always mix up which one says which, um, it has a it has a laundry list of the implications of do not bear false witness against your neighbor, and I just think social media has been the absolute worst <laughs> thing for keeping the ninth commandment because it is so easy oh to fall into the easy habits of um, vitriol and hate. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah, don't get me started on that one. Okay, yeah. it even goes like like you can see vitriol and hate coming out of social media. And then you can spew vitriol and hate at the vitriol and hate. Like it yes, just multiplies. Yeah. So it's like <laughs> we can be so quick to judge our Christian brothers and sisters because mm -hmm. they tweeted such and such. And I don't think that's sufficient honor. Or I think that's slander or there's, there's just, the we just, just How stop. could a Christian tweet something like that? <laughs> right. Okay. For, for all of the cringe that it was uh i always remember this one line from a bible man episode <laughs> where uh in typical fashion the villain was a anthropomorphized version of the demon of pride uh. and they're watching bible man through the little you know star trek computer screen and they're like right. aha it's working it's like what do you mean boss he's he's so completely humble about things don't you understand minion He's he's being prideful about not being prideful. We got him on both <laughs> angles. <laughs> and yes, there's danger there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is one of the many reasons I am not on Facebook or any other social media platform because you are not missing out on much. Yeah, if, even if I have a soft spot in my heart for some of the people and interactions I've had on Twitter, you're not missing much. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the cat videos my wife shows me, so that's fine. Or the recipes and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. But but actually, as, as an elder, I don't want to have to police mm -hmm. Facebook and say, okay, that was out of line. How am I going to do it? On Facebook? Yeah, <laughs> right. That's brilliant. It's not going to work. Now, maybe running away from it is cowardice, but it's... It is amazing how many grown-up Christians don't get it. Yeah. The law applies here. You're still under Jesus' authority here, too. Watch your yeah. The law of God is still the law of God, just be, even in cyberspace. Mm -hmm. well, you still have to love your brother. Yeah. And cyberspace mm -hmm. is so decontextualized. Uh, James Carey, in his book, um, The Sacred Art of Joking, talks mm -hmm. about how humor is entirely dependent on an understanding between the comedian and the audience and this shared experience of being together. Yeah. And so you take any joke and you read it out on the, on, you know, 
the six o'clock news and you say, do you think that was appropriate to say? Well, no, nothing sounds appropriate to say if you say it on the six o'clock news. Um, yes. But it, there's there's no shared experience right. yeah. on Facebook or on Twitter. Well, yeah, it's a whole different kettle of fish. Yeah. Yep. But the broader concept here, as you, <laughs> as you pointed out, as you started us, is that we are to love even our enemies, let alone our rulers. And that means praying for them, blessing them, doing good to them, not slandering them. Mm -hmm. So here we are again. We are, we don't get to invent ethics in terms of how people are treating us or how we feel they're treating us. Mm. Ethics are something that spring out of God's holy nature, the eternal love that exists among the persons of the Trinity, and that has been spelled out for us in Scripture as practical application. Yep. And in some ways, second only to you need to trust Jesus for your salvation <laughs> is this extension. And that will mean then that he will set the agenda for your life. Yeah. And he will at times tell you things you don't want to hear and don't want to do. And you will find them incredibly hard and impossible. I remember coming out of a, a, of a Bible class um, when I was quite young and the, the pastor had been teaching on love, your, love your enemy. And one gentleman who had been in the church for years uh, came to me and said, oh, you, you, can you believe that? You can't believe that. I mean, that, how could you do that? I mean, that's, that's not, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, have you ever had someone really hate your guts? I mean, really hate your guts? You know, how could you love someone like that? Yeah, I, I know the Bible says that, but that old Bible says a lot of things. you got to go by common sense, too. Hmm. Wow. Uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah. No, something I <laughs> Something I forgot to bring up earlier uh, was sort of a, a, what's the word I'm looking for? A rejoinder to mm -hmm. the discussion about authority and about rebellion. Uh, and that is a, a story that takes place in Genesis where uh, Simeon and Levi, both sons of Jacob, uh, before, actually the chapter right before he becomes Israel mm -hmm. and their sister is, is raped by a uh, the, the son of a ruler nearby. And I can't mm -hmm. remember if the city was named Shechem or if the ruler's son was named Shechem, but Shechem is involved yeah. as a name somewhere in the story. <laughs> it's both. It is. Oh, thank you. And what essentially happens is the man is apparently either remorseful or just very full of lust for this woman. He has his father come to Jacob and ask for her, her hand and they you know, if look, we'll we'll let you marry, we'll let your sons marry our daughters, and we'll have our do our sons marry your daughters, and it'll it'll be great. It'll be a big old thing. Like we'll just like name your bride price, and so mm -hmm. the brothers deceitfully answer. It says, and they say, um, "Circumcise yourselves, become like us. We can't give our 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 sister to someone who's uncircumcised." And mm -hmm. then on the third day. When the pain is very great from the circumcision, they march in and they slaughter every man in the city and take the women and the children and there is much weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jacob is not happy with this. And <laughs> it is to be assumed that neither is God. <laughs> um, that act is an act of vigilantism because yeah. they have determined for themselves the extent of the punishment mm -hmm. and not only on the one who is actually guilty of the 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 actual sin it is a sin i want right. that to be clear but also to everyone in the city even mm. though like this is this is the only time i can think of in scripture where there was a large city that that said yes we will we will take on the covenant sign yeah in the Old Testament, an entire city said, yes, we will be circumcised. <laughs> and, you know, maybe their hearts weren't all there, but that is putting them in the position of the blessings yeah. of God. And the two sons' response, Simeon and Levi, is to murder them all in vengeance. Yes. And it, it, it's, not, it's not the duly appointed authority of Simeon and Levi to execute anyone but they right. take that on themselves in um consequence of that they are both 
stripped of any inheritance in the promised land. God turns it around for for Levi at least. I don't remember if Simeon is is bound up in that. Yeah, Simeon gets uh, dispersed amongst the boundaries of Judah, which saves That's them right. from the apostasy of the other tribes because right. they go with Judah to fight the battle first. So, it, but they but they remain scattered. the The words are the, the words are hold true, but God turns the curse into the blessing when they Thankfully. kiss the rod and submit to it. Yes, and so with all of that being said. Yeah, they, they undertake this authority that does not belong to them. And in doing so, they are actually rebelling against God's established mm-hmm. authorities by yeah. not going through uh, these things. But then I, I, I really want to emphasize this point. They lost people that would have come under blessing. Mm-hmm. And vengeance is something that not only will it have consequences for you and and your own soul, uh, even even just even if you only have the heart attitude of desiring vengeance, it it will destroy you from within. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it, it also has a very blatant, a very in its fullest expressions, uh, a, a temporal damage to the other people, and. As Christians, if the law, if fulfilling the law is the expression of love, and God tells you don't take vengeance on people, <laughs> you you need to be aware of how what you are enacting in is 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 not just disobedience to God, but it's hatred of your fellow man. Yeah. It's saying, nope, these people don't matter, and I if I hate them, then that's good enough. Uh, for me and my sword or gun or poison pill or whatever method you decide to use. And that is wicked. Like Jesus says, offenses will come, but woe to him by whom the offenses (laughs) come. Yes. Thinking of Jonah too. Oh yes. Jonah is another excellent (laughs) example here. Hatred of of your fellow men. Yeah, inviting a whole bunch of people to church so that you can kill them when they walk through the doors. Yeah, no. No. The way of the Lord is hard in that it is so contrary to the flesh. Mm -hmm. We want to solve, and I find this in myself all the time, we want to solve things by practical, easily manageable problems with the the, uh, facilities we have at hand. Mm -hmm. Whether it be uh, a word or a bullet or the media or... You know, if I could a government this, program. This this, yeah, if I just did this, this, and this, and sometimes I find myself stuck back and say, and that would all be in the flesh, and God would get no glory, and it therefore would not work, and yeah. I would be at odds with the gospel. And it's hard, I don't mean hard I don't, lessons. I don't mean to just like bring in a Marvel a Marvel reference again. Uh, we've already mentioned that at least <laughs> once this episode, um, but. Spoilers in the Avengers Infinity War movie, the first one. So if you haven't watched it and you plan to hit mute right now, just wait like 30 <laughs> seconds. Uh, Thanos explains his plan to save the universe, yeah. and it is not the hard way. He says the hardest choices require the strongest of wills. But the mm-hmm. ir- irony is that that's not a hard choice at all. Deciding yeah. to, you know, spoilers again, uh, kill half the population so the other half can can thrive and let's be real it's about thriving not surviving there's no high morality here (laughs) um you it's bad i mean that's the easiest way to put it it's just bad (laughs) well i think again we with with that that's probably a good place to uh draw things to a close don't you think I think so. We're we're doing our characteristic thing of ending on a downer note, but hey. <laughs> downer notes. Yeah, we'll we need a bell <laughs> for downer notes as well as Gnosticism. No. We're still in the Old Testament. We're still in the covenants of promise, not the fulfilled. It's true. It's going to be a bummer. Uh, the the early church and, well, even through to today, celebrate, <laughs> celebrate, quote unquote, Advent, because we look back to the time when the church in Israel still waiting for the messiah yeah. and it's sad because sin is sad and it sucks <laughs> to deal with its effects every day so here's the here's the the reverse of the downer note we ended on jesus did come yes. yeah 
Joy to the world. Joy to the world. Let's do recommendations. Do we have recommendations today? <laughs> yes. I have Good. three recommendations. Oh. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Can I give all of them? Yes. Do it. Okay. All right. First, I'm going to uh, recommend something to eat, and that is real sugar. It's better than all of the zero cal sweeteners. It's <laughs> better for you. I am willing to die on this hill. <laughs> um, second of all, something to watch. Um, and this comes with a caveat. Um, but my recommendation is the TV show MASH, not the movie, the TV show. And my husband hates it. So, well, he doesn't hate it, but he, he doesn't like it the way that I do. I enjoy it very much. But Okay, the caveat is, of course, everyone is always having an affair with everyone else, and it's dreadful. Um, oh my! But it's it's so much better than so much stuff you'll watch on TV, like current TV. Like, oh, yeah. First of all, it's it's objectively hilarious. It's it the the funniness is legit funny. Um, but I feel like the the moral problems I have with it are so much easier to recognize as evil and dismiss because the writers take them so lightly. Ah, yes. Uh, you know, it's not like friends where we're supposed to feel good that these people are committing fornication. <laughs> we're supposed to be happy for them. Like, no, we can recognize that this whole situation is stupid and ridiculous and we can laugh at it and move on. Um, yeah. So mash. And then my third recommendation, I'm taking lots of liberties today. Um, my third recommendation I'm going to recommend because soon I'm pretty sure I won't want to recommend it. And that is being pregnant. Um, I'm still enjoying it. So I want to say that it's very cool. And if you are a married woman, I would encourage you to <laughs> seek pregnancy. <laughs> because the baby moves and she's like all cuddly inside and it's fun. <laughs> Lovely. Okay, well, with reference to the second and not the third point, I will now recommend something to watch. I, I, I do this because my wife and I, the last couple of nights, have been watched Lost in Space. Oh. Now, anybody who remembers the old version will look askance at this recommendation, and rightly so. Or who remembers the movie, which was horrible, <laughs> um, although some ways better than the TV show. Uh, I found myself crying last night. I don't know why exactly. <laughs> but one element most certainly was the emphasis upon family. Mm. There's a point where the children have been separated from their parents and basically have been told, run. And there comes a moment when, but some of them say, but we have a chance to save our parents now. Well, your parents don't want that. They've told you to run. We don't even know if we can save them. And one little boy stands up and says, but I want to try. And mm -hmm. I want each of the children says, yes. And I was just said, I'm about to do it again. It was a very moving moment for me. And as we watch the series develop, we go from what is really a very dysfunctional family to a family that has learned to love one another. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't involve moral compromises to love one another they are overcoming their moral compromises to love one another they become more moral in the process um they they conform themselves unconsciously perhaps and yet more clearly closely to god's law as they learn to love each other they don't have to cut corners and cheat and so at the end of it it's like this is a family i would love to have living next door um and they are they are learning how to die to self, how to be humble, how to admit mm. they're wrong, and how to risk their lives for one another. That against some very fast-moving, uh, rather exciting sci-fi action, if you like, killer robots. So, <laughs> Lost in Space. So is that, that's the new one or the- It's a new one on Netflix. Oh, it's actually good. That's good to yes, know. Yes, it is. The, the, the second season is, is even better than the first. First is pretty good, the second is excellent. Oh, this is the oh. Third season? My wife says this is the third season. Oh, okay. I'm not sure about that. But she's well, that, that's good to know then. Yeah, I, I always look askance at uh, most Netflix series that, that come across my like screen when I'm, yeah. when I'm browsing. Mainly because 
the majority of them are horrible. Yeah, um, oh, absolutely. Yeah. So that that's very good to know. Uh, for my recommendations, I think I have two if I can keep them in my head long enough while I'm explaining the first one. Uh, the first one, I am also going to recommend a show to watch, um, which I'd be honestly surprised if any of our listeners have not watched it yet. Uh, but that is Firefly, because oh, my yeah. wife and I have been watching through it. It, it also comes with caveats. You will have to fast forward through scenes involving the state-sanctioned prostitute character. Mm-hmm. Um but it's very good, and there's been multiple times where we've been watching it and just, like, we've just kind of thought, wow, Mal is, like, unironically acting like a Christian right now. Right? It's yes. great. Mm-hmm. Like, so many times. And, of course, it's witty and it's funny and very well paced, very well written. All of the things that you would want a show to be that is good uh and and as proof of its goodness, Fox canceled it after the first season. <laughs> Before the first season was even done. I'm still not over it. Um, my second recommendation is uh, a thing to do, and that is to bake bread. Mm. Because now I, w- I will say, when the pandemic happened and everyone was stuck at home and there was that whole thing where everyone was baking bread sometime <laughs> yeah. in uh, May or June of uh, of that year, I adamantly refused to take part. So I want you to know this did not come about because of the pandemic. And, so you uh, can some keep kind your of, hipster cred. I will be a hipster. <laughs> Dang it. And uh, anyway, I, I, I picked it up like towards the end of the year. And um, I found a recipe this week because I, I, I realized well, I work now. I, I found a job. Thank God. And um the normal bread recipe, it takes like nine hours because it you 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 mix the dough and then you let it stand and then you let it rise and then you check it and I think you deflate it and then you let it rise again and each of the rising is like three hours and it's like there's no way you do this in an evening. And I found a recipe that takes two and a half hours total. And so I, I've made it twice now. And it is really, really delicious. I will include a link, or whoever puts together the show notes will include a link to this one so that you can <laughs> try it out. We're going to show notes again someday. <laughs> one day. Uh, but it's very good. You can just, you can also find it really easy by searching like no need bread dough or yeah. um, quick bread or something. And it's, it's very easy. You know, it's what goes into most bread. But there's something... I hesitate to say spiritual, but there's something spiritual about <laughs> making bread because of all of the things that bread represents in scripture. And it's like, I am making the bread. Yes, the little lump of leaven I have placed into it. And it is the kingdom of God, this bread loaf that I have made. <laughs> so I recommend that. <laughs> all right. And those are our recommendations. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. Thank you to Emily and Greg for joining me. Thank you. If you would like to follow us, you can find us on YouTube, on Rumble, and you can follow our Facebook page where we occasionally post some dank memes for you to laugh at. Uh, and then you can listen to us through any podcast catcher of your choice. Uh, if you'd like to email us, you can do that at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com, and we will read your fan and or hate mail with the same amount of joy and trepidation. You can also, if you want to support us, uh, do so through our Anchor page, anchor.fm slash haltingtowardszion. And we thank all the people who do support us financially. And finally, thanks to David Emily's lawfully wedded husband uh, for all the work that he does. And yes, thanks again. We'll see you next time. Bye.